Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I rise with pleasure to speak on the state of the state of Tasmania in 2019. I have to say at the outset that listening to the Premier deliver his state of the state a couple of years ago was like a couple of weeks ago was like uh, being in a parallel universe. Um, the universe that, that I live in and the universe that is the real world is the one where the United Nations has called this the critical decade in front of us, uh, where we have been given just 11 years to dramatically cut our carbon emissions. And it's also the universe uh, where there was a, a massive recent uh, bushfire across southern and central and northwestern Tasmania that uh, decimated 3% of the state's area, burnt 6% of the World Heritage Area, and nearly wiped out a number of really important um, regional towns in Tasmania. But the world in which the Premier delivered the state of the state was one in which he lives, and uh, so does the Liberal Party uh, here in Tasmania and at the federal level. He spoke for 35 or 40 minutes without giving any nod to the bushfires which have just happened. Um, he didn't mention climate change in any meaningful way. Uh, this is a government which continues to live in a world which is not the one that Tasmanians inhabit. It's a dangerous to continue to uh, deny what is happening around us and uh, to not take this year uh, as a really important turning point for this state uh, from a budgetary point of view, uh, from an action and planning point of view, to set us up as well as possible for the coming uh, decades and centuries where climate has changed and will continue to change um, beyond our control um, as, and also to play our part in mitigating the emissions that we are contributing along with other countries uh, on the planet that is increasing the level of warming to what many scientists believe uh, is a, a level which is uh, endangering human life and other ecosystems. Madam Speaker, I can still smell when I go into uh, a neighbour's house the smoke from the bushfires. I live in Signet, uh, across, the, across the river from Jeeveston, and this summer was very stressful for every, everyone who lived in southern, central and northwestern Tasmania. Um, I fear it, it, it is, is the new norm for us in Tasmania for summers. Uh, summers will be increasingly approached with a level of anxiety and stress. Uh, some people who have had that recent experience will be um, sort of sensitised to, uh, to come to the next summer with a level of anxiety which they haven't previously felt. So certainly the experience of having, um, you know, living through two solid weeks of incredibly smoke-filled air um, if, uh, it, it's very unusual. <laughs> it's very unusual for Tasmanians and people who um, lived through the 1967 bushfires do, uh, w were very surprised at, at how drawn out this fire period was. It wasn't the experience in 1967. The fire went um, from the western side of the Huon River, jumped to the eastern side and went to the Derwent just in one day. So this was... Um, it, it, a very different profile of bushfire um, and what we've come to understand from Dr David Bowman and other uh, pyroecologists at the university here and from people overseas is that this is what we have to adapt to and respond to. So what's clear, Madam Speaker, is that uh, we have new and changed threats to wilderness and to human settlements. Um, we have an international responsibility to protect our wilderness. And we know um, from the footage of uh, some of the world's most uh, loved and certainly Tasmania's most well-known uh, wilderness photographers, people like Rob Blakers and Grant Dixon, um, incredible photographs that they took of the damage that has occurred to the World Heritage Area. Hewan Gorge, where fire-prone ridges were burnt to gravel and relic uh, relics vegetation, uh, including rainforests, was burnt through. The Craycroft Valley, where old growth forests, including rainforests, was also burnt through. The rainforest and tall eucalypt there will take centuries to recover, if at all. The Crest Range, Madam Speaker, with old growth forest 
which is also expected to take centuries to recover, if at all. There was fire encroachment at Mount Bobs, which protects the largest surviving forest of Tasmanian endemic King Billy Pines, and incineration of that paleo-endemic stronghold was only avoided due to the absence of a very hot, windy day. There was no strategy, Madam Speaker, and no resources allocated that could have averted that global catastrophe if the fire weather had not, if the fire, um, if the weather had not changed as it did. The East Picton Valley was uh, extremely flammable post-logging region that was uh, um, with a, a rainforest understory that has damaged rainforest and tall eucalypt that will take centuries to recover, if at all. The Middle Huon Valley, also uh, with sassafras and myrtle that were killed, uh, that will probably never recover. And Federation Peak, finally, was the fire burnt to within only a few kilometres of Tasmania's most iconic mountain, uh, a stronghold of King Billy Pines and other paleo-endemic vegetation. Madam Speaker, uh, this was the photographic evidence, and people can have a look at this on the Mercury website if they, if they want to have a look at it for themselves at the damage that has occurred. This was the photographic evidence uh, what we don't have is the, uh, the emotional evidence of the impact on people's lives um, and the incredible uh, amount of work and um, care and kindness that was shown by all the people, paid and unpaid, who responded to that bushfire. And I want to um, thank, Madam Speaker, all the people who were involved in the, the fire response in, in my experience as a member for Franklin in the Huon Valley. Uh, people who, who worked for weeks. I spoke to one man who worked 23 days non-stop, uh, camped on the floor uh, on a mattress in the fire station um, in Jeeveston. They didn't have enough beds. Uh, his lilo went down, so he was sleeping basically on the concrete floor on a lilo for 23 days. Uh, nights, um, and, um, and going out every day to fight the fire. I spoke to people who, uh, a woman who had just was uh, at the Jeeveston fire station and decided to cook the food each day for the firefighters who came back. Uh, she did that work by herself because other people were busy doing other things, and every single day she cooked roasts and other cooked meals for people who came back. This is the sort of way that the Tasmanian community comes together. And what brings me hope and spirit, Madam Speaker, is knowing that regardless of our differences in views about how the world is and how we should respond, the next time there's a summer, the next time there's a catastrophic bushfire and it will come, we will all be together fighting that fire. And I think we all need to reflect on that. We are all affected together by the changes that are happening, which is what gives me a great hope that we will find solutions together. Despite the fact that this Liberal government continues to fail to act in the way it needs to on the threats confronting us, I know, Madam Speaker, that ultimately we will all find the solutions that we need to find because we have to. So, Madam Speaker, I mean, I think the words of the, um, the, the, the fire chiefs who spoke up yesterday, 23 fire chiefs uh, from around the country, made very, very impassioned call for the Prime Minister, uh, for the leader of the, um, for the, Lab the Labor Party, federal uh, Labor Party and Liberal parties, to, to, to sit up and take action and understand that we must do everything we can to uh, accept that climate change is upon us, it's perilous, and we need to do more about it. They were the words of Bob Conroy, a fire manager. We also had present uh, the previous former head of the Tasmanian Fire Service, Mike Brown. These people know firsthand the experience of fighting fires they know much better than any of us uh, that this is uh, a serious change which has happened in their recent lifetimes of fighting fires, in the profile of fire, and that has been caused by the global warming and the changing climate. So, Madam Speaker, 
What I want to do is talk about how we need to respond. Uh, this is what we need, the action that we need to be taking in this state in the next year. The Greens have been thinking about this and working on this, and uh, the good news is for the Liberal government is that they can, uh, they can take heart because we do have solutions. There are responses that we can take. Uh, the, the scientists are telling us that we have a very short amount of time to act. We have only 11 years. The International Panel on Climate Change, which produced the report I have in my hand, uh, entitled Global Warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius. They produced that report last October. And they make it very clear, Madam Speaker, the 90 scientists that put that together from around the world, that uh, the 1.5 degrees Celsius maximum level that we can possibly reach in terms of um, the average temperature on the planet, the maximum that we can possibly reach um, and be confident, well, at least be comfortable that there's a prospect that uh, humans and ecosystems will be able to survive the way that we have done, that level uh, is fast approaching, much faster than we thought only five and ten years ago. And so um, they, they have called very strongly for us to do everything we can to uh, reduce our carbon dioxide emissions. We have to uh, claw back the use of fossil fuels so that we reach a zero fossil fuel use uh, in 2040 and that we have reduced our emissions to zero by 2040. That means that we need to be reducing our emissions by 45 per cent in just 11 years' time. So, Madam, Madam Speaker, climate change is not a theory any longer. It's not a model. It's at the door. It's in the house. It's what's happening now. And this is calling for us to respond in a way that we've never done before. It actually requires a major transformation in many aspects of society uh, and in the next 10 years. It's a daunting prospect if you think about that in its totality. So what we have to do is just pull it apart piece by piece uh, and, and really get on with it. And solutions are being proposed all the time. The first and obvious contribution that Australia can make is to stop uh, exporting coal, to stop digging it out of the ground. 80% of Australian coal goes overseas. We have to stop that completely. There is just no sense uh, in, in making a, a decision about where to balance the risks and making a decision to continue to export coal uh, when we know that it's threatening human life, um, it's threatening the exist existence of all ecosystems. For the last three years in Australia, our Australian carbon dioxide emissions have gone up. We need these to be going down dramatically, but in the last three years, they've been going up. So clearly, Madam Speaker, um, the situation as it is can't remain. Yet at the moment, uh, at the federal level, we have literally no climate change policy that is operating. There is no functioning climate change policy in Australia. And there hasn't been for at least six years. Uh, there has been a series of uh, rolling doors, uh, a, a, a series of revolving prime ministers, uh, all who have failed to uh, take action against the coal lobby and against the, uh, the conservative arm of the Liberal Party who are, um, who are committed to coal at any cost. This is what we have to get rid of. We have to get rid of this federal Liberal government Apologies, Madam Speaker. Uh, but th that is absolutely required, you know. And we also cannot let the Labor Party um, have a, 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 a mandate to rule in uh, the federal level because they are also committed to coal, because they won't shut the door on Adani. You know, we have to have all parties in Australia making a commitment to end coal mining. That's what the Greens are committed to. And that's what the young people are calling us to do. They've read the science, they've looked around the world, and they're quite clear. 
that uh, we must uh, feel the fear. In the words of Greta Thunberg, the 16-year-old from, from Sweden, she says, I want you to feel fear. This is a crisis. And contrast that with Scott Morrison and his comments about coal in Parliament, laughing as he held up, as he holds up, as he held up a piece of coal and said, um, "You know, don't be afraid of it. Don't be scared." Well, thinking people are scared, Madam Speaker, but thinking people are also committed to action. And we know from the leadership that the young people have shown that it is through collective action that we will achieve effective change <coughs> and we will also bring hope and lift the clouds of depression that so many uh, young people and, and adults are feeling. A sense of paralysis, Madam Speaker, about what to do next, which makes many people feel like um, pulling the doona over their head. And I'm not surprised, and <laughs> I don't blame them. It is, it's a lot to take in. But, you know, that is, that is our job, to open our eyes. Um, it's clear that we need a new economic vision, and it has to be compelling. Uh, we have to be off carbon deposits, and um, we are essentially leaving a period that humans have inhabited for a really long time, a nice predictable period uh, with predictable cycles of climate. Uh, we're moving into unpredictable water cycles. That's what happens when there's a warmer planet. So, Madam Speaker, we need to end business as usual, and that's what was so disturbing about hearing the Premier's State of the State address. It was 40 minutes of business as usual. It was essentially a shopping list of roads. Um, it was a pre-election shopping list that um, completely ignored the biggest issues that we face, uh, including the threat of bushfires next summer. Um, and it completely annoyed, uh, ignored the fact that all of our ecological systems in Tasmania, as they are uh, pl planetary-wide, are in crisis. Now, I want to um, talk about the fantastic work that's been done to, um, in the Midlands, the northern Midlands of Australia, of Tasmania, by Island Arc and also uh, with, the, with the worker scientists from UTAS, the Bushfire CRC, the CRC for Forestry, uh, Greening Australia, and a number of uh, landowners in the Northern Midlands. They are working hard to restore and connect uh, the habitat to create a stronghold for the next uh, 50 years uh, and beyond. Uh, so that uh, some of our most critically endangered animals can still be travelling with us in Tasmania in 2080. That is one of their goals, and I think it's a beautiful goal because it's very, very clear. We want to have the animals that we have around us here uh, when our children are growing up and our grandchildren. Uh, they are beautiful, uh, but also they provide... Um, they contribute to the health of the systems that we live in. We're just finding out more and more all the time about the little betongs that are an incredibly important part of uh, snuffling and turning over the uh, soil under trees uh, so that the uh, eucalypts can survive for a lot longer than, um, than they otherwise would. Echidnas, thank you. Thank you, Ms O'Connor. You're absolutely right. So the work that, um, that is being done in the Northern Midlands is... Uh, incredibly important. Uh, healthy woodlands have um, aesthetic value, but they also provide uh, us with a, a service, an ecosystem service. They give shade and shelter for animals. Um, they reduce erosion and uh, hold the structure of the uh, soil. They uh, improve the quality of water. Uh, they control the pests, and uh, they are important for maintaining biodiversity. All of these things are critical for farmers to be able to continue to farm. Uh, this is uh, about as much about protecting the quality of the soils for agriculture as they are about protecting the integrity of the woodlands themselves. Um, the aim of this work is to try and keep a connective corridor between the eastern and western side of Tasmania. This matters, Madam Speaker. 
uh, to keep these links. And the research that these scientists are doing is incredibly practical and is showing us how, um, how we can do that and how we can stop uh, tree decline and uh, the enormous uh, decline in a number of eucalypt species, which unfortunately is happening because of the uh, changing climate and the increasing dryness. Madam Speaker, we want to have a marine environment which is um, densely full of marine life, which um, is able to respond and deal with the warming waters that, um, that we are already experiencing. Uh, some of the fastest warming waters on the planet are off the eastern uh, coast of Tasmania. So we want to have a marine environment which is as um, healthy as possible to be able to adapt to those warming waters. Instead, uh, sadly, concerningly, what we're hearing is that uh, the east coast of Tasmania is in the, uh, the eastern waters of Tasmania are in a very serious state of crisis. Uh, the work from the IMAS scientists uh, that was released in December makes it very clear that unless we act very fast, 32% of eastern coast rocky reefs will be gone by 2021. And that is an incredible loss. That's only two years' time. That is probably, uh, knowing the scientists and that work, a conservative estimate. It may well be the case that we've suffered uh, at, <coughs> at that extensive loss. And the reason is, Madam Speaker, uh, there's many reasons, but a, a predominant reason is uh, Centra Stephanus or the sea urchin which has um, come in through the warmer waters and is creating sea urchin barrens. And we know that the only uh, effective predator is the rock lobster for the sea urchins. And so unless we do everything that we can to um, help rock lobsters to um, survive and grow to an old enough age to predate upon sea urchins, then we are at risk of losing our rocky reefs, and with them will go the abalone and rock lobster commercial industries and the recreational fishing industries for abalone and rock lobster. So, Madam Speaker, again, this is, this is another big, huge change which is happening in a large uh, ecosystem in Tasmania, and it requires us to take a concerted action and have leadership from this government. And um, the Greens will continue to shine the light on the um, ineffectiveness of the laws that we have in Tasmania to protect our marine environment. Not only uh, do we have an EPA which does not have the legal teeth to be able to go after um, an oil rig that comes in and, um, and, and to get an inspection of the risk uh, from an oil rig and what it carries on it, that's sitting in the Derwent for a, a couple of months. Uh, we don't have an EPA that has the teeth to uh, prevent the expansion of fish farms into areas which are clearly not suitable. Um, Storm Bay, for example. We don't have uh, laws that have created a marine farming panel that protects the independence and the integrity of scientists uh, so that the decisions that are made by the marine farming panel um, are essentially a rubber stamping for whatever industry the salmon farming industry would like to do and wherever they would like to go. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, Mr Deputy Speaker, how much longer do I have? Ooh, uh, I reckon somewhere around eight or ten minutes, but... I think there's a I'll bit longer to find minutes. out. Six minutes. OK. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, the other system which is... Um, which needs our concerted attention is the, um, the current situation with plastic and waste. Um, off the shelf, we have sitting here since uh, this government came, uh, since the Liberals came to government in 2014, uh, Minister Groom at the time had um, a, a waste levy sitting on his desk that he could have signed off. Um, instead, 
he did not do what all the councils around Tasmania agreed would be uh, a good idea. Uh, he put that aside. Uh, we've had another five years where we desperately need a state waste levy. We desperately need a container deposit scheme in Tasmania. We are the second last state in Australia to have one. It's been sitting there. It's strongly supported by the community. Uh, it is uh, strongly... It, it, it's strongly supported by the scouts and community groups and uh, it will make uh, every difference to reducing the ocean of plastic which has been developed, which is developing and which is affecting um, every part of the marine environment, uh, filtering down microplastics are now, uh, are now recognised, are now found in every part of the benthic layer, in birds, uh, in mammals, and ultimately in human food. So this is something that we have to take action on. It's sitting here, something the Greens will continue to push for this year. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, we will continue to speak for strong gun laws in this state. Uh, we know that, uh, we will, that, that we must never weaken gun laws. We must never pander to certain sections of the community who would like to put convenience, personal convenience, above safety. Uh, there are many reasons why we must look to keep strong gun laws. Uh, we don't need to go further than what happened here in Tasmania, in Port Arthur. Uh, but we have had recent evidence of New Zealand taking heart from what we did and using our Tasmanian strong gun laws as an example that they have picked up and now they have uh, also brought in strong gun laws in New Zealand. So we will continue to be the party that fights for strong gun laws in, Tas in Tasmania. We will also be the party that continues to speak up for people in the justice system when nobody else cares about them. Uh, we, we, uh, we do believe that the, the manner in which a society uh, treats its weakest and most defenceless people says everything about the character of that society. Uh, we, must be, um, we must understand the relationship between um, providing uh, a house for people and the effect it has on their life. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, in conclusion, um, we are at a critical juncture. It demands that we have out-of-the-box thinking and not business as usual. It was very depressing to hear the weak state of the state uh, from a report from the Premier a couple of weeks ago uh, when we know that the planet is warming far more rapidly uh, than it can absorb, that we have uh, health and housing in Tasmania that are catastrophically underfunded, that this is creating a gap between Tasmanians, those people with a house and those people without. That gap is tragically enormous. It is intergenerationally unjust. It is having an impact on people's lives every day, whether they personally are without a house or not, or living in rental stress, they know somebody who is. And it's an example, Madam Speaker, of the importance of working to make sure that we uh, reduce that gap because there are many challenges for us as a state. Um, uh, and at its core, we need people to be able to have the basics of life. And there are clearly Tasmanians who don't have a house, uh, who don't have access uh, to the health services they need when they need it. Uh, who don't have access to the food of the right quality uh, and nutritional benefit, and um, who don't have mental health services when they need them. What we need is uh, to bridge that gap, to prioritise the things that mean the most to people, um, and the budget that the Premier delivers uh, will tell everything to Tasmanians about the things that the Liberals value. And I really hope that the Premier has listened to what's happened um, in recent times from the firefighters who spoke out,
from the children on the school strikes for climate, from the unions who are asking for respect in conditions and salary, that he listens to those people and understands that the budget he delivers must speak to the poorest Tasmanian and must speak to the children of the future who will uh, be here sitting in this parliament in 10, 20, 30 years time, uh, working on, this, on the issues of uh, governing for a just Tasmania uh, in a climate which will be probably different to the one that we have today. So uh, the job of this government is to deliver a budget for the next year so we can act on the things in Tasmania that matter the most.